the topic that we have unusual manifestations of usual infections so what is unusual either the presentation of the illness is unusual or you find that when you're treating the patient there's an unusual response to therapy so that's what we mean by unusual manifestations and why do they behave unusual either it's because the organism is unusual so the organism may be more virulent there is appearance of drug resistance we are not going to take this part into the discussion because this will be going more into antimicrobial resistance there could be host factors the host factors could be because of immunodeficiency malnutrition associated medications like steroids chemotherapy and that's why the infection is behaving more unusual so again this is part of a talk of immunodeficiency which i'm not going to cover the other reason why these infections behave unusual is because of the doctor factors and one of the reason of doctor factors is because we have no knowledge about it it's not unusual it's probably one of the common manifestations that we just don't know about it or we really don't want to know about it so we don't update ourselves we are still you know using chloramphenicol to treat uh, say enteric fever and that's the reason why the infection behaves in an abnormal manner i'm going to take you through cases because i thought it would be more important to go through cases and talk about common infections that we see in practice i cannot cover the whole gamut of unusual manifestations but three common illnesses that we see in practice this is a 2 year old girl she had fever for 12 days and cough for 15 days she's been hospitalized for a pneumonia treated with amoxicillin ceftriaxone but there has been no response when you examine her she's got a fever of 103 she's got bilateral crepes she has leukocytosis with lymphocytosis her crp is 30 blood culture is negative and she has slightly elevated liver enzymes and this is her x ray so you really don't pick up any lobar infiltrates you really don't see any kind of tb in this patient now what would you like to do i want the audience to wake up and tell me what would you like to do in such a scenario you have this child who's running fever for 15 days this is the kind of extra that you see and you have bilateral crepes on examination do you think it's viral your crp was 30 you given enough antibiotics to treat this a viral going on for 15 days is a little unusual so probably what we have not thought of it is an atypical infection and what we did in this child is we did a throat swab and we sent it for a multiplex pcr and we found a mycoplasma pneumonia Now, what we have been taught about mycoplasma pneumonia, it's usually in school going age uh, children, so it's more than five years of age. Most of these infections are self-limited illnesses of gradual subacute onset, progressing to high-grade fever and a persistent cough. And on uh, auscultation, you're going to get crepes and bronchi. But I think it's a myth. If you really look for mycoplasma, you'll pick it up at any age. So the first myth that it occurs only in school going age children is wrong. So this is one aspect that I really wanted to discuss with you because this is what we see in clinical practice and we really don't think about mycoplasma. The unusual manifestations of mycoplasma can be severe pneumonia, it can be exacerbation of asthma, they can come to you as encephalitis, hemolytic anemia, renal dysfunction, GI complaints and even Steven Johnson's. But these are really unusual manifestations. how do we pick up mycoplasma if you look at the cdc the way they have said you do a culture not possible it's only in the research labs serology is what we normally do and we usually send mycoplasma igm but remember mycoplasma igm can remain positive for 3 months so ideally you are supposed to do an acute and a convalescent sample so if you really want to prove it by serology you are going to look at convalescent sample by which time the patient has already recovered and you it's no point doing the serology Molecular tests are available, but when you send for molecular tests, uh, one thing I wanted to tell you: a lot of PCR labs have come up, at least in Mumbai and lots of part of the country, which offer you PCR facilities for various diseases and various infections. You really need to know.
know the PCR test that you are sending, whether it's validated or it's not. If you look at the molecular test for mycoplasma, there are only two tests that are validated and approved by the US FDA, and that one is filmerin and the other is illuminigen. So if you're going to do my other tests, you may pick up a lot of false positive, false negatives. Especially I've burnt my fingers with HIV testing, PCR, where we did a study in 2004, and out of the kids that we kept on uh, monitoring the infants with PCR for HIV, 50% were false positive. I actually had to go to the labs to find out what the reason was. And we found out that it's an in-house PCR where there's a lot of contamination that takes place. So we really have to be careful which tests that we're using and for what we are using these tests. As I told you, PCR, be careful how you interpret because sometimes mycoplasma may be there in your throat, it's just a colonizer. It may not be causing an infection. So you really need to correlate all your investigations with the clinical manifestation of this disease. Now treatment-wise, we know that we are supposed to use macrolides or in older children we can use tetracycline. So in this child, we gave five days of azithromycin after we got that mycoplasma positive. There was no response. What do you want to do? Which drug would you like to give? Yes, everybody says levoflox. That's true because we can use quinolones and there have been reports that for microlite resistant mycoplasma, the drug of choice is actually a quinolone because of their mechanism of action and they have a good penetration into the lung tissue. So these are the patients where you would have to consider quinolones actually. So the key message from this case is that we need to know for a particular disease what are the likely organisms even they, though they do not form into that particular age group so that we do not miss a particular infection. I think this is the problem even with the germs as we have problems with uh, infections that some of the infections feel really bad if we leave them aside and don't think about it. This is another common scenario that you will see. A six-year-old boy has come to with a right focal convulsion. A CT scan has shown a seven millimeter lesion in the left frontal lobe, suggestive of NCC. He's given albendazole for 28 days with anti-epileptics. A scan is not done later on to check what's happened, but one year later he again has a focal convulsion. This time when he comes, MRI brain was done, which shows a tuberculoma. Same lesion, now reported as a tuberculum. We see this very often and we don't know what to do. What would you like to do? So if you look at the type of the lesion, it says, uh, if you look at the textbooks, they'll tell you cystic circa, usually round tuberculum, usually irregular and solid. Tuberculomas are usually more than two centimeters. They have a lot of edema, peripheral edema, and they lead to focal neurological deficit. So if we are going to look at tuberculomas, they are usually going to be this kind of shaggy, round, uh, shaggy, irregular, and large lesions. That's how we expect the tuberculomas to be here. But when you have this round lesion, small in size, hardly any perilesional edema, we have these criteria for NCC. So we have these absolute criteria, we have a major criteria, minor, and we have epidemiological criteria. So if we can do a histology, which is not possible, then we look at the scolex, then we look at uh, the ophthal and ask them to look on fundoscopy if there are subretinal parasites. We try to do the ELISA's anti circle antibodies, not available everywhere. And then we look at resolution after the treatment with albendazole. We have minor criteria which we hardly follow and India will definitely always fill into the epidemiological criteria. And we have these definitive diagnoses and probable diagnoses. All this helps you to a certain extent. But when you are in a dilemma where TB is also endemic and NCC is also endemic and you have a lesion that's as small as this without a scolex, what do you do? Should we do a CSF? How many of you all would do a CSF? Remember, when you have a space occupying lesion, you may not have meningitis, and you may not get a CSF which is positive. So, in a space occupying lesion, LP may have a very low diagnostic yield. So, it may not be very useful. And if you have a lot of uh, perilesional edema, you may not also be able to do CSF because of the raised icity. 
Should we do a Mantu? It stretches. Again, it's not going to be very useful. As we said, Mantu, most of us in India would be Mantu positive. So, any other way to differentiate? Yeah, so we could do an MR spectrum. An MR spectrum is something which is very useful to distinguish tuberculoma from other infective granulomas. And what happens in TB is actually you look at the lipid peaks because the cell wall of the mycobacterium tuberculosis is full of lipids. So if you look at the lipid peaks, you know this is TB. You can also look at the ratio of choline and creatinine ratio if it's greater than 1 in TB. So a lot of times MR spectro is very useful. Most of the centers which offer MRI now offer you MR spectro also. So this would be a key message is that you decide on the right investigation. You may go along the track of doing a CSF or you may do a gene exporter. Go on the right track of doing the right investigation. And the other thing that we need to keep in mind is we see a lot of abscesses we see a lot of pus collections, we see a lot of empires. 16 year old boy, he had a fall on the right shoulder a month ago. There was a fracture. Subsequently, he developed fever for 15 days and MRI showed osteomyelitis. He was hospitalized, deprivement was done and the pus culture grew MRSA, resistant to clinomycin. So we know the bug, we know the antibiotic profile. He was given vancomycin and linozolid. However, he continued to have fever. He kept on developing abscesses everywhere in the forearms, both the legs, osteomyelitis of the right femur. He had already completed 10 days of vanco and lenizolid when the reference was sent. There were new lesions continuously developing and he continued to have high fever with a CRP of 212. When you go through the file, you find that initially he had leukopenia to begin with and a repeat blood culture to the echo is normal. So you have this MRSA, you're getting the right antibiotic, but he's just not responding. What do you think is happening? Yeah, so you have to think of a condition called as a PBL toxin producing staph aureus. It's a toxin that destroys the WBC. So whenever you have a staph infection with a leukopenia, initially, think of PBL. And these genes of PBL are carried both by MSSA and MRSA. And when should you suspect PBL staph? Whenever you have a necrotizing skin tissue infection, recurrent abscesses, the entire family is getting, they're passing on the infection from one to the other. You have an immunocompetent child, like this boy is immunocompetent and he's got a severe infection. It's associated with high ESR, high CRP, and particularly with osteomyelitis. How do you diagnose PBL is you need to do a genetic test or you do a toxin assay, so it's not available. So most of the times you're going to suspect PBL on clinical grounds and how do you treat this? You need to treat with an anti-staph agent that is going to kill the toxin, so you need to have clindamycin, linozolid, or rifampicin, any of these. So if you have an MRSA and you use vancomycin, it's not going to work. You need to add something like clindamycin or rifampicin. You need to debride out all the pockets of staph aureus and in spite of no improvement then you may consider IVIG because it's supposed to neutralize the exotoxins. Now in our patient we'd already given vancomycin. He was on lenozolid just to cover this PBL staph right from the beginning but he kept on developing new abscesses. So what did we do? We drained out all these abscesses, gave him IVIG and the fever subsided and the CRP came down. But now he has pain in the right leg, there is an osteomyelitis there. What do we do? What is the cause of a leg pain? Is it just an osteomyelitis? So this is what we need to keep in mind that in staph audience, especially PBL staph, there is a high risk of deep pain thrombosis, which needs to be treated with low molecular weight heparin. The, cause, the duration of low molecular weight heparin is not known. We did a Doppler in our patient. He had a DVT and he was started on low molecular weight apparent. We gave him antibiotics for four weeks. At the end of four weeks, everything was gone. The reason for presenting this case is you will see a lot of abscesses. You have to decide which kind of antibiotic you want to use. Do you want to use a one which is going to cover a PBL staph? If you have a PBL staph, look at the leukopenia and the high ESR and CRP issue. And that is what is going to help you. So these were 
the three cases that I wanted to discuss with you. What this case taught us, you need to keep updated with the latest guidelines and treatment protocols because they keep on changing with newer evidence that keeps on coming out. So the list could go on and on and we could go on for miles and miles. But I think in short, what I wanted to tell you all is most of the unusual manifestations are actually known manifestations of that infection. So it's nothing unusual about it. We just need to be aware about we need to be aware about it. And if we could be rational in our prescribing practices, we could prevent a lot of these unusual manifestations. So some fodder for all of us to think about, which we hardly do, and we can call it laziness, some may call it deep thought. Thank you very much.